This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. My name is Paula Lai Sussex, and I teach German at the IMLR. And I'm going to, chairing this, uh, to be chairing this second session. Um, I thought the beginning of, the, uh, uh, of this day was, was great. I think we have a really good start with, uh, with our first discussion. And I just hope that this will be just a continuation, not a new stuff, a continuation of what we've been doing. But of course we'll be getting the, uh, the other view, you know, the view from our colleagues uh, in, in other European countries. So, um, we'll launch straight into it. Um, our first speaker is uh, Professor Eva Ekramer. Uh, she's the Head of Department of Romance Studies at the University of Mannheim. She is also uh, the president of the Deutsche Romanistikverband, so the German Subject Association for Romance Studies. Thank you very much. Um, actually, when I uh, came here, I was thinking, what, why did they invite me, precisely me? Is it about uh, the very funny romance studies model that we have in the German-speaking area? Maybe a little bit, but maybe there is a, a bit more to it. So I was raising the question. Uh, what is modern language research? And it was kind of um, interesting to me this morning, the discussion that was going on is, is completely different than the discussion that I know from my country because there's not, no such <coughs> thing as modern language research. There's no talking about that. Uh, it's uh, completely differently fragmented in uh, sections, um, somehow historically grown. And the question that I want to raise is more, can we drop disciplinarity? Where does it take us? Why do we need it? Why do we need the labels and the institutions to come with it? It's also a lot about funding and how to get funding many times, uh, if we want it or not. And maybe we can reframe it a little bit. So the term itself is not relevant at all. Um, it's not there in the discipline itself. I mean, uh, I would meet my colleagues and I would say I'm a linguist, and I'm working on this in that language, some of them. Um, but uh, they would never say I'm a um, modern language researcher. It wouldn't, wouldn't be there. Um, and there's no such study program, I would know. Um, there's something that people call like language and communication, and then you see what's in the program. But there wouldn't be a degree for it. Uh, the philological background of Roman studies may be interesting because it's completely different. Ah, it does not show up. Ah, it will be there. <laughs> It's only a couple of slides, don't worry. <laughs> um, the uh, romance field, Romanistik in Germany, is by itself an interdisciplinary field. It covers um, spoken, written, mediated language in context in the Romania Continua, so when, where Roman languages were spoken, where they went through colonialism and where they disappeared. It's also in our field. So myself, I'm also working on Creole languages, and it's 15 languages. It's not just Spanish and Portuguese and French and Italian. There's much more to it. And it's very hard to um, foster that idea in modern academia because it's a lot about minorities as well. And I think that's an idea that we shouldn't forget when we talk about languages. There's a lot of very, very small languages in the world. And if we don't take care of them, uh, nobody will do research on them. Way. So what we do is kind of try to live something like a uni uh, unity in diversity. Uh, we have all these different languages and we have colleagues comparing these languages to other languages, any kind, and they're all associated in uh, what we call the German-speaking humanistic, the so-called DACH projects as well that are, are given funding sometimes, so D for Germany, Austria and uh, Switzerland. Me, myself, I'm, for example, Austrian, when I work in Germany. And the idea of Romanistic does not exist outside the German-speaking area. So when I try to explain to somebody else that I'm a Romance philologist, they look at me and say, this is something really strange. So do you speak all of them? And so how many of them do you have to speak to be a Romance philologist? It's kind of a weird idea for, for other people coming from other countries. And I think we're pretty much aware of that. And I'm, when um, I, now six years that I was working for the association, um, it was kind of preaching that unity and diversity and saying that this is a discipline that is actually up to our uh, 21st century because we compare
other cultures, we look at the intercultural, we look at uh, the media, we look at the, the differences between the cultures. So maybe this is also a model to learn. Uh, we don't do national philology, we don't do that because it's comparative in itself. We try to include the translation of those studies. That's a very important aspect because the Roman philologists, when they become Roman philologists, uh, then they might head towards translation, but it's, it's one branch within their career, might go for a chair, and it's the only possibility to be responsible for one language only. The only single chairs there are all over the German-speaking areas is within translation studies. Then you're responsible for one language. In romance departments, it's not possible. It has to be at least more than one language. So there's that rule that you tell every youngster in the field. You have to know uh, at least more than one romance languages, in normally three or sometimes four. <coughs> not all, of course, on the same level. You can never do that, but it, it's wanted. It's a contrastive subject by itself, so it's always looking at the different um, literatures, uh, the different media, uh, it's also about film and about everything that came up to it and expanded. And I want to raise the question if disciplines are useful at all. Um, one person I always want to quote, it's a, a long quotation, but I love it, and, and I would, didn't want to leave without uh, using it here. Heinz von first uh, uh, migrated in the 30s, he, he was Austrian, um, was one of the founders of cybernetics. Uh, went to the US and tried something completely new, dissolving the disciplinary boundaries. And what he said, and I think we could use it also when we talk about language research, I would recommend to drop disciplinarity wherever one can. Disciplines are an outgrowth of academia. In academia, you appoint somebody, and then in order to give him a name, he must be a historian, a physicist, a chemist, a biologist, or a biophysicist. He has to have a name. Here's a human being, Joe Smith, he suddenly has a label around his neck. Biophysicist. Now he has to live up to that label and push away everything that is not biophysics. Otherwise, people will doubt that, he, that he's a biophysicist. If he's talking to somebody about astronomy, they will say, I don't know, you're not talking about your area of competence, you're talking about astronomy, and there is the department of astronomy. Those are the people over there, and things of that sort. Disciplines are an after effect of the institutional situation. It's very hard. <laughs> he said that more than 20 years ago, and shortly after, unfortunately, he died, but I think he's one of the person that was trying to like open the minds and say, we are asking questions. Uh, what we do in science is we ask, uh, and humanities, we ask questions, and we, we want to give good answers to questions. And sometimes the discipline might also hinder us, or might uh, put a barrier in terms of like finding the right methodology, finding the right theory, and finding the right answer to the question that we want to answer. Of course, um, I would never say that to my association, because what we have to do there is call, look at, well, do we get the funding, and where, how do we save the chairs in the departments, and I'm writing angry letters to all kinds of <laughs> chancellors and rectors, and trying to save the money for the discipline. So we're right in between these, this tension. Now, on one hand, we want to give good answers to interesting questions. On the other hand, we need the money to answer these questions. And the disciplines, in my hand, are very important to raise the money. It's about a funding question, basically. And it's sometimes also a question of survival. So many times I have to tell, like, for a good university, it needs Roman studies. You can't drop that. You simply can't drop that. It has to be there. I mean, there is no good argument <laughs> that I could possibly put forward. The German department will say the same thing, and the Slavic department will say exactly the same thing. Um, but, in fact, it's also a way of, like, um, survival. You know, we have to survive. So the recent um, developments, when we look at it, is it's very hard to crack disciplinary boundaries in terms of prerequisites bound to the disciplines. When I'm talking to young people, um, and I was responsible for young researchers for the past six years as vice president of my university, what do I tell them, you know? Live up to the rules of your discipline. If you don't, you will never have a chair. That's it, you know? I can't tell them, look at the interesting questions and try to find the right methodology. Of course, that's the people in the department that tell them. But if they want to succeed in the field, they need to live up to the rules of the discipline. 
So the hiring is done according to that. You might be familiar with the German system. We have that really uh, crazy system of the Habilitation. So after writing the PhD, you go for another larger second book that is evaluated by a large commission. And only when you finish that, you're able to be hired. And this Habilitation is always connected with the label. And this label is crucial for your hiring afterwards. So when people ask me, and say, what kind of label should I put? I say, please, the largest label possible. <laughs> and the largest label possible is like Romance Philology, Linguistics, or Romance Philology, Literature. Yeah. But they can't go beyond that. They're kind of in a course that they cannot move onto a chair if they don't have the label. The funding is completely bound to this. Uh, the famous Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft here at DFG, where most of the funding comes from. So the state gives the money to the DFG, and the DFG distributes the money to the scientific communities. I've talked a lot to them uh, during the past years about how they're organized and who decides and what kind of uh, counseling measures on the money and what kind of money and the amount of money that is given. And they kind of reorganize, but it's still completely bound to disciplines. And the disciplines and the associations nominate people to be in these boards. And the boards decides on, decides on the funding. So it can't work without the disciplinary background. So there's another reason why it's very hard to dissolve. Somehow we got them to reframe so that they said something like historical linguistics and all the people working on any language uh, with linguistic methodology and they go for money have to apply to a specific board and there's a board uh, composed by people who are relevant in the field. I'm important what kind of languages they're working on but they know about what might be interesting research. Then the disciplinary expansions. Within my own discipline we could observe in the past years a turn towards cultural studies a communicative turn, a strong turn towards media studies and communication studies. There's even now some, some of the chairs um, are nominated, like uh, a, a chair for. It's two minutes? Okay. <laughs> it's a chair for uh, media studies of the Romance countries, all of them, a lot of them internationally, <laughs> um, of course, which nobody covers, but you touch on it in a certain uh, thing. There's um, a growth towards transdisciplinary approaches, uh, especially on the master level, um, and didactics, because uh, Roman philologists, German, philo uh, German philologists, and uh, English philologists, they're usually responsible for the teaching, uh, the, the education of the teachers, uh, future teachers. So we have these Bologna effects that on one side uh, crash our discipline, on one hand, because a mono BA program, three years, never leads to three uh, to two plus one languages. Never. You can't do that. You know, it, it, the people wouldn't get the level in three years. So the only way is uh, to create four-year programs that would allow them uh, to go to, towards two plus one languages, and then uh, later on in a master, specialize on literature or specialize on linguistics. So they might have a very broad uh, knowledge. So the master level works across the disciplines, but the BA level doesn't work across uh, the disciplines. It's very hard to introduce programs, but sometimes they're interesting combination. And there's something that I felt a lot with the young students coming in. In the first year, they already raised questions like employability. Like, where do I go? What do I do after my studies? I don't remember that I asked myself that question when I studied <laughs> years ago. But it's a, there's a very strong pressure on them uh, in, a, in order to say what, what they're going to do precisely after these kind of studies, which is, I think universities are not there for that particular, uh, <laughs> I mean, people have to be employable, people have to be able to think further than other people, they have to answer good questions, research-based, but we're not responsible to offer full employability. But this is what we're continuously asking. The German system is divided to universities, Hochschulen, um, universities of applied sciences, which are heading towards employability, and then the third level is the so-called uh, duale Ausbildung, where people work and at the same time they study, and the company pays for their study, 
which is also heading towards employability. And in the university section, we could even say, no, we're not responsible for that. We are responsible for the people who go beyond uh, employability. They will be employed somehow, but they go beyond. But still, what we do sometimes, like we have a study programs that are called uh, economy and culture. Hmm. So people do a philological study, two thirds, and they do one third of economy in order to show later on that they can do certain things in economy. And there's a certain threat, I would even say, on multilingualism within academia. It gets harder and harder, not only on the student level, but also within the colleagues uh, to get people uh, towards multilingualism um, and, and tell them that even a Roman philologist cannot really choose. We have to write in a variety of languages, but are we read in a variety of languages? So when we write in German, what we usually did for our field, nobody reads us. Yeah, in, on an international level. Uh, but if I write in French, my Spanish colleagues cannot read me anymore <laughs> because many of them don't have a knowledge of French anymore. If I write in Portuguese, I'm writing more of for the Portuguese community. So there is very little choice uh, in terms of multilingualism and I fear yeah, that the multilingualism within our own field, within academia, will uh, degrade. So. Can we drop disciplinarity and answer questions only? Very hard. And I think this is a very good initiative to ask us where within that tension we place us uh, to on the one hand not lose the funding and uh, the standing within the universities and on the other hand answer the right questions that we think relevant for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva, also for raising questions um, uh, of the feasibility of what we are trying to achieve. I think that's, that's very, uh, very important. Um, our next speaker is Beata Baczynska, uh, professor of Spanish at Wroclaw University in Poland. And um, you are really a Hispanist by training? Yes, okay. I've got some, some books. I was thinking about uh, Roman studies in, in Poland if my English is not enough to preserve the topics of this conference, so you can just distribute them to the same uh, I prepared some screenshots just to present the um, Polish situation in my university. University of Wrocław is the fourth university in, uh, in Poland, more or less. Uh, it was founded in the 17th century uh, uh, by local the Imperial Austria. In the 19th, 19th century, it was a German university, Prussian university. Where, um, uh, with that particularity that it has three faculties of theology, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> and at that very moment, there was the first uh, department of uh, Slavonic studies. So in a way, it is a good place to study philology because we need, uh, uh, we, um, uh, our university, at our university, we uh, use philology as a denomination of our discipline, Polish, this, uh, Polish philology and modern languages are philologists. Uh, Poland, for historical reasons, in the last 25 years, um, have to transform its language policies that was a challenge for all the departments, modern language departments, because till 89, uh, the, um, we were from Russian, at our primary and secondary schools, and the second language was English, German, or French. Uh, after 89, everything had changed. Now, English is the first language taught at schools and second languages are uh, other Western languages and now Russian is romantic 
uh, getting back to these goals. So for, um, for us, uh, especially for Romans departments, it is a problem because till 89 we uh, worked with very well prepared linguistically studied students and now, especially at uh, Romans departments, but now also German studies departments, we have students with no previous knowledge of language. <coughs> Uh, we lacked professors in Spanish, which uh, was in demand and still is one of the most growing languages in Poland. So, uh, uh, some uh, our emigrant professors, after retirement, worked with us. This is Professor Florian Schmierja, uh, um, who uh, have his uh, PhD at King's College in London, and he worked with us uh, in the 90s, and this year we, uh, he was honored by the Senate of our university, uh, uh, the title of Dr. Honoris Causa of the university, and he got also the condecoration, uh, very important condecoration for his uh, environment, uh, uh, the order of Isabella Catolica. So that's a little bit of history. Faculty of Philology at our university, uh, there's two areas of uh, study. Our um, area, uh, that is Philology, Modern Languages, is at the moment Latin and Greek, but also at the same department, um, because the name has changed from its study, classical studies, Mediterranean studies, and Oriental studies. They are introducing Arabic, Korean, and Chinese, uh, phil uh, Dutch philology, English philology, French, German, Slavic, Spanish, and at the very moment, uh, Italian philology. We are quite uh, accustomed to the denomination philology. It's, it's now a terminological problem. Um, we tend to change to, uh, uh, to French studies, Spanish studies, uh, German studies. In, in uh, the bottom of our department, so we can see that the first translation the English one is with is philology, the French one, the Duit Romaine. The departments uh, present the, um, the diversity, but the, mm, the likes of professors in, for instance, in uh, Spanish, because we work on the one department, uh, uh, the department uh, um, Spanish studies or Hispanic studies, but Department of uh, French Linguistics, Department of Literature and uh, Civilization, French and Italian, Department of Translation Studies, and two sub-departments with didactic, uh, uh, dedicated to um, the, um, French as a foreign language and Spanish as a foreign language. The problem is the uh, uh, Professor Ruiz's habilitation, because we got the same problem as the uh, German colleagues. Uh, in uh, four years ago, there was a, a new um, law on higher education, and at the very moment, the disciplines are defined as, <coughs> as you can see here, humanities, fields of studies. Uh, there is no mention of modern languages. We have linguistics, literary studies, cultural studies. No translation studies. Uh, we are applying to, to uh, promote new disciplines, such as a um, um, discipline called in Polish Glottodidactica, that is foreign language acquisition but in an interdisciplinary uh, context as well as translation studies. It is uh, it's 
square meter, that's the central formation for the degrees. And they, um, they are later in glass, and that's the problem, uh, the same problem as, um, as in Germany. Uh, there is a no, new institution, uh, a National Science Center, um, which offers grants for uh, research. And here we've got the other type of uh, um, definitions of the area of studies. Our projects are supposed to be art, humanities, and social science. And this is age. Uh, school cultures and cultural creativity. Practically no mention of uh, modern languages. I will skip it. There is another program uh, of the ministry, the national program for the development of humanities, as well the uh, sub programs, tradition, development, they do not include modern languages. They are focused on national culture and national literature, mostly. It's very difficult for us to, um, you know, to propose a project in that area. The uh, uh, third one, uh, uh, internationalization, is um, 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 they are um, supporting translation of um, translation into English or other Congress languages, the most uh, important books um, uh, on humanities within the college. Uh, recently there is a great discussion about humanities, there is a crisis um, committee uh, for the uh, Polish uh, humanities, but I will stress that Modern language researchers rather do not take part in that debate. And you've got very many, uh, a lot of work with our undergraduate students because these, uh, um, um, these, um, uh, our, uh, we've got plenty of students while other humanity, humanity careers not always. And that, uh, yeah, free. Uh, um, research stories. Uh, Ivana Kaspersky from Poznan University, the trans the logical implication of the cultural uh, uh, translation. It was an ERC project focused on, on Mexico, gender studies, and the very last one, uh, the Justina Alonso from Warsaw University. Uh, research interests in history and topology of pre Hispanic and colonial Mesoamerica, Nahuatl language, philology, and linguistics, European indigenous and intercultural communication in both states, regionalization of minority language with a special focus on Nahuatl. A very interesting uh, project and research. Uh, um, I think that's the, the very best of the modern language studies. To, to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those insights. It was really interesting to see the, um, the proliferation of, uh, <coughs> of departments within, within the languages, which is you know, really completely foreign to our thinking. Um, right, um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Rebecca Samartin Bastida uh, from the University of Madrid. Mm -hmm. And um, your research, I think, is in Spanish and Portuguese literature. Mm -hmm. Spanish. 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 Right. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank Catherine um, Davis for inviting me uh, to explain here the situation of other languages uh, in Spanish uh, universities. In Spain, till recently, uh, uh, Spanish hasn't been included in modern languages. As a Complutense, for example, one of the greatest universities in Spain for the number of students and also for the quality of the research, modern languages since 1954 till 10 years ago included Italian, English, German, and French, each one studied in different degrees or literatures. The Slavic, Semitic, or Arabic were not considered part of the studies in modern languages, but 
within the new European higher education area, the old Romanicas, we call them the also Romance languages, uh, and Slavic Slavic languages are now included in a new degree. Grado en lenguas modernas y sus literaturas, between modern languages and literatures, where Arabic can also be taught. Uh, I show you here the, the structure of this degree. Um, 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 well, um, some French, German, uh, Arabic, Italian, Russian, and majors inside this degree. Uh, and English, uh, Polish, Spanish, and minor, probably because both constitute independent degrees, I mean, English and Spanish, as well as, curiously enough, Semitic and Islamic studies and classical studies. I say curiously enough because French or Italian are not studied from the independent degrees now. In general, um, departments of modern languages at the Complutense are smaller than the dedicated to Spanish studies, being an, an exception, the one on English studies. In this sense, I should say that the smaller the department, the less interdisciplinarity it shows. The teaching approach is in the smaller departments is very much philological. Um, only when we move to biggest departments, we can find studies on cinema, visual arts, or cultural studies combined with those of language and literature. And the department's comp compartmentalization is uh, rather strong. I should say, in the Spanish studies at the Complutense, we count with no less than four departments. The Department of Language and Literary Theory, the Department of Spanish Literature, the Department of Latin American Literature, this, this in the Faculty of Philology, and the Department of Spanish Language and Literature at the, at the Faculty of Journalism. So from this division, we can see that literary theory is separated or differentiated from Spanish literature and moved within linguistics, and this happens a lot at the Spanish universities since our tradition of literary theory is very much attached to the study of language. No surprise then that we have a degree in comparative literature and a master in literary studies, different from the degree and master in Spanish language and literature or in modern languages. This makes us, the scholars who are interested in literary theory, but work for instance inside the department of Spanish literature, a bit uncomfortable, since we don't fit in this artificial distinction between theory and literature, and some of us, when teaching, never forget to take into account interdisciplinarity or literary theory, even if supposedly it's not our field of study. On the other hand, the master in literary studies have a lot of scholars, I should you hear that, class, from the English, French, German, and, um, well, and um, German, Italian, Semitic, or Spanish departments to work together, and I think this has been a major achievement in Spain. I don't know if you see here. This is the Master Literary Studies. Um, anyhow, as I've suggested, in Spain, it's usual to separate language from literary studies if the, department, if the departments are big enough. Now this trend is changing. Since in secondary school, both disciplines are taught together. I mean, language and literature. But some people think this is a mistake. In spite of this, not only literature and language are confined to different departments at the Complutense, but also to different masters. A research master in Spanish literature and a research master in, in Spanish language. Here you have the courses that are given in each of them. Um, this is a master in Investigación en Lengua Española, Spanish language, um, and the other one is a master in Lengua Española. Well, as you can see from these study plans, the Master in Studio Literarios, I mean the Master in Literary Studies, is the one which offers interdisciplinarity. The others are centered in the old tradition of studying books and movements, the literature one, or semantic, sensing, syntax, the language one. No wonder I must say that our, our graduate students complain that these two masters repeat some contents already taught at the degree. My point of view. We have a lot of students in modern languages, and here I include the ones dedicated to Spanish studies. The students that want to be secondary school teachers, translators, scholars, to work at editorial roles, etc. But if we want to improve our teaching methods and make them more European, we should consider this interdisciplinarity and elaborate the degrees taken as a model the master in literary studies, which is the leader in the number of students since clearly this interdisciplinarity appeals to students more than specialization 
and gives a broader view of what humanities are, as in the old times in Spain, we have the degree in philosophy and letters, and as is encouraged by the European higher education area. Erasmus students who come to Spain still complain of two theoretical classes or lessons, sorry, with no huge participation, and this is partly due to the apicular rate of students per class, above all in Spanish and English studies, that prevent, that prevent more tutorial lessons. Um, being in Bologna, Spanish universities have tried to give an hour more of what we call practicas, but in many cases this is only translated into one more hour of teaching with the same old method, and indeed at the Complutense, we now teach two hours theoretical lessons in two days for each course, which leaves the students quite tired due to the force of concentration. <laughs> <laughs> As much as <laughs> So regarding Erasmus students, I must say that whereas British students here uh, in modern languages have the chance to spend <coughs> a year abroad in addition to the three years of the degree, in Spain the time abroad offered to students is shorter. A semester at most, and because of the crisis, students can barely afford a trimester. Mm -hmm. Since there are no other financial support than the Erasmus fellowships, and that's a small sum. Many families can't afford to pay more for the sons or daughters, and there is no longer help from the Spanish banks. Uh, I give you here some statistics. For 250 students that our faculty receives each year, the Faculty of Philology, there are only 100 Spanish students that go abroad, and the past year, just some 50 students due to the economic crisis. Germany is the country that sends us more students, followed by Italy, United Kingdom, and France. But we send very few students to Germany since they are more interested in English speaking countries, in the United Kingdom, or also in Italy and France. Um, also, I must say that the level of ability to speak in a foreign language is uneven. Finishing the modern language degree at the Complutense, um, or the, the English studies, completely, gives you a C2 in English, a C1 in French, a C1 in Italian, and a B2 in German. So it's certainly an event. And we require a, a B1 to start the English degree, but you don't need any previous knowledge in French, Italian, and German. So the, the, this one, the, these students who go for English students are better, better prepared. Since we study the Spanish and modern languages degree, you don't need to have achieved high, high grades at secondary school or in selectividad, which is a process of selection that the Spanish students have to go after finishing a school. We have the added problems of students coming without vocation, only because it's the only degree they can study due to their low grades. And in the case of the Spanish, it's a seemingly easy degree, easy degree if you dominate your native language. So summing up. I think we have some problems in Spain with modern languages. <laughs> At least we should engage students with interdisciplinarity, I mean anthropology, visual arts, politics, relegated at the competence to the master in literary studies, which I have pointed out is the most popular. And as I see, we should focus on ways of teaching how to do research in our masters in literature and language. That is to focus on research instead than on the old traditional contents, philological contents, because that's already done in the degrees. Furthermore, I think we need more communication between departments, not only between the ones dedicated to Spanish studies, but also with the English ones or the others that conform the modern languages program <coughs> as our faculty or other Spanish faculties. And finally, and most important, I think it's a pity that the scholars that carry on research projects uh, not only suffer from lack of funding, but significant in modern languages now in Spain, but also can teach about the object of their research at the master level. Courses are designed without taking into account our research interests, uh, but even so, there are good news. We have an increasing number of students that go for the doctorate, doctorate degree, and this is not for the title, since as you may know, the unemployment in Spain is very high, even in the frame of people with PhDs. Maybe it's a way of making the most of our lifetime at home or keeping the family's comfort, but anyhow, it is a fact, I think it's a good fact. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insight. And now we are having a final view from uh, Paris. Uh, Dr. Christine Law Johnston. He works at the University of Sorbonne in Paris. 
and uh, she works in the area of literature and culture for the English speaking world. Well. So, um, I would like to thank our hosts for inviting me to speak today. It's a great um, pleasure. Um, I've been a senior lecturer in English at the University of Southern Valley in Paris um, since 2000. And we still talk of foreign languages in France um, as opposed to modern languages. So, I used quotation marks um, for the title of my presentation. But the desirable trend towards interdisciplinarity, which has been discussed here, is certainly present. And yet, there is a lot of resistance to it uh, in several ways. So, what I will do is I will examine factors that contribute to maintain disciplines and factors of change that encourage interdisciplinarity. And then I'll look at examples of what appears as emerging directions for research. So to start with uh, institutional, the institutional structure and specificities of the French uh, research system, um, research in France currently falls in the care of the Ministry of National Education, Higher Education and Research, that's the full name of it. And um, our Minister of Education is uh, Najat Velvet Kassem. And uh, there's a junior minister for higher education and research, uh, Thierry Mandon, as of June 17th uh, this year. Um, within the Education Ministry, the Junior Ministry of Higher Education and Research is in charge of. 142 institutions that are called, uh, considered as uh, altogether établissement public à caractère scientifique, culturel et professionnel, and that includes 73 universities and 23 commu uh, communities of universities and institutions, which were until recently called PRES, Pôle de Recherche et l'Enseignement Supérieur. So the whole complex of higher education and research institutions naturally forms an intricate structure in France, and French universities have been in the process of restructuring for several years now. So it's quite complex and evolving. But um, to focus on today's topic, most foreign languages research is done um, at universities and uh, also the new commune that have uh, humanities and social sciences faculties, and also at the CNFS, which is a research-only institution. But, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the CNFS, which stands for uh, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, uh, the National Center for Scientific Research, which is a public research organization that is placed under the authority of the education ministry. Uh, it encompasses all fields of knowledge and is structured into eight institutes and languages, whether we call them foreign or modern, are part of the Institute, institute of um, Social Sciences and uh, Humanities. And languages uh, pertain mainly to Section 35 philosophical and philological sciences and art sciences, and um, sometimes may also depend on section 34, sciences of languages. So the official scientific policy of the institute is to encourage interaction among disciplines, both within uh, humanities and social sciences, and also with research fields from other uh, CNRS institutes. And the motto of the CNRS as a whole, as you can see on this model, is uh, Dépasser les frontières, to go beyond borders. And it really acts, I think, uh, really functions as a fertile ground in terms of innovation through cooperation among the disciplines, uh, the transfer of problematics from one field to another, and the crossing of research methods. That's its um, official goal, but <coughs> I think it works um, to some extent. Now, <clears throat> concerning research conducted in universities, the CNU, the National Council of Universities, plays a key role in the organization of disciplines. The role of its members is to deliberate, 
to deliberate sorry, and make decisions regarding the qualification, recruitment and promotion of fellow academics. The CNU is made up of 11 groups corresponding with major research fields and these groups are divided into 52 sections corresponding with the various disciplines. So languages fall in group 3, um, which is Let et Sciences Humaines, and um, then English, for example, which uh, I'm part of, is section 11, which is called, unfortunately, English and then group sets in languages and literatures. <laughs> Sad but true. Um, although some researchers may depend on more than one CNU section, uh, for instance, a colleague may belong to um, English, uh, may be uh, qualified in English and art history at the same time. On the whole, the CNU has a conservative role um, in maintaining disciplines that are well established. Now, I was saying before that languages are still collectively called foreign languages in French universities. Uh, to take the example of my university, I teach in the Department of the Anglophone World, that's the one on the last slide, Mon Anglophone, which itself is part of the overall um, UFR, long and so on. So, um, faculty of foreign languages, literatures, cultures, and uh, societies. And that faculty now has six departments. Um, now, in France, um, English, like other foreign languages, is taught according to three main uh, research areas, uh, which are also found in the curriculum of the Agrégation, which is one of the two uh, national teaching qualifications. There's a CAPES, which is a more general qualification, and the Agrégation is a bit more difficult and more specialized, and it has three uh, options that the students can choose uh, one of the three, literature, civilization, and linguistics. Um, and this structuring, uh, um, of course, part of our work is to um, uh, prepare future teachers, but some aggregation uh, aggregé will then move on to do a PhD, or some of them already have it before they do the aggregation and will then apply for jobs at university. So this contributes to uh, the sense of uh, belonging to a discipline and making choices, um, a kind of job. Um, and this structuring altogether doesn't really encourage work across uh, specialties, not to mention uh, disciplines or languages. Although this is changing uh, with the new generation of researchers. And so I will move on to uh, talking about recent changes, which result mainly from both European and uh, French government initiatives. So the um, changes that have been taking place are mainly the result of the impulse of the Bologna reforms, uh, which started in 1999. And um, in that spirit, several initiatives uh, have been taken in France, including uh, the creation of the INR, the funding agency, and of the AERES, now the HCERES, an evaluation agency. So I'll talk a little bit about the INR, the National Agency for Research, it was created in 2005, and it funds, okay, it's a funding agency. The um, HCERES <laughs> is a, an evaluation uh, agency. Oh, I've lost my. I just wanted to end on um, a sort of assessment, uh, which is quite personal, of whether all these uh, measures, which aim at, at stimulating interdisciplinarity, have worked or not. And uh, one can be skeptical. Uh, because it sometimes distorts the kind of projects that people uh, put together when they apply for funding. But at the same time, uh, it seems to me that it has changed things and it has worked to a certain extent. In particular, I wanted to talk about the GES, Group d'Intérêt Scientifique, and uh, which is, um, um, depends on the CNRS and which functions as 
clusters of institutions that create uh, flexible collaborative networks. And I'll just give two examples. There's the uh, Institut des Amis, which was created in 2007. And as the name indicates, it focuses on the study of the American continent. Uh, but it aims at having a comparative trans-American and transdisciplinary approach. So, which means that, uh, for example, um, I being from English, uh, if I join this, um, one of the projects, projects, so it will uh, work with, uh, obviously, colleagues uh, who work in Spanish, traditionally. Uh, the other uh, such GES, which um, is quite prominent as, at the moment, is the Institut du Genre, the Gender Institute, and fo it focuses on gender studies uh, in all sorts of fields, and um, it's, it's quite uh, successful as well. The idea is that uh, researchers will come up with new problematics and theorization, and uh, it aims in particular at articulating research that's done in France and in the French-speaking world, so it has its own uh, cultural um, zone. Thank you.